<clears throat> okay, hello. Um, uh, today is the, um, the 22nd of March uh, 2022, and we'll uh, pay homage to three architects. We'll start with Kenzo Tange, who died on this day uh, in 2005. A uh, great, uh, truly very important um, Japanese uh, architect. And so Kenzo Tange, uh, you see, he died on the 22nd of March. He was born in 1913, was a Japanese architect and winner of the 1987 Pritzker Prize for Architecture. He was one of the most significant architects of the 20th century, combining traditional Japanese styles with modernism and designed major buildings on five continents. His career spanned the entire second half of the 20th century, producing numerous distinctive buildings in Tokyo, other Japanese cities and cities around the world, as well as ambitious physical plans for Tokyo and its environs. Tange was also an influential patron of the metabolist movement. He said it was, I believe, around 1959 or at the beginning of the 60s that I began to think about what I was later to call structuralism, a reference to the architectural movement known as Dutch. Uh, structuralism, <clears throat> influenced from the, an early age by the Swiss modernist Le Corbusier, Tange gained international recognition <clears throat> in, in 1949 when he won the competition for the design of Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. He was a member of SIAM, Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, in the 1950s. He did not join the group of younger SIAM architects known as Team uh, 10. Although his uh, 1960 Tokyo pl Bay Plan was influential for Team 10 in the 1960s, as well as the group that became Metabolism. His university studies on urbanism put him in an ideal position to handle redevelopment projects after the Second World War. His ideas were explored in designs for Tokyo and Skopje. Tange's work influenced a generation of architects across the world. <clears throat> so um, I will look at some pictures with him here. He is in Ahmedabad contemplating the work of, uh, of Le Corbusier. Uh, again, here in a later age, uh, a very uh, interesting architect and man. And I, uh, he was indeed uh, one of the fathers of modernism in Japan. Um, a charismatic man and uh, quite able to, to convince many people about his ideas. What is it about the Japanese that they are so convincing in architecture? Well, look at them here, you know. I mean, all of them defeated, you know, in the Second World War, and all of them triumphantly, uh, you know, uh, not losing uh, hope in life and in creativity. Tange is in the center. I really love these Japanese, you know, what is it about them that, 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 that they are able to, you know, continually produce interesting works? I think it's their experimental, and I, I actually read, and they even live long, long lives because they don't value too much their lives in a way. And they are very capable of, of self-sacrifice and they work a lot. Please be kind and turn off the microphone because I, it's, it's, a, it's a background uh, noise. Uh, unless you want to say something. Thank you. This is what Kenzo Tange said. Architects today tend to depreciate themselves, to regard themselves as no more than just ordinary citizens without the power to reform the future. Indeed, how many architects today think about reforming the future? Uh, there is a powerful need for symbolism. And that means the architecture must have something that appeals to the human heart, the heart, not the brain. There is a powerful need for symbolism. Well, <laughs> here, here is written twice. Anyway, but I think it's very important what he said. Particularly, I, I mean, you know, for symbolism, are we thinking about symbolism in architecture today? Not very often. And are we thinking about the human heart? Not very often. Inconsistency itself breeds vitality. Beautiful. 
beautiful because this statement is actually advocating the fluidity and the surprises, the accidents, the even the incoherence of life. You know, and, and, and you cannot have creativity where you have to continuously, logically, you know, be, uh, you know, mathematically correct and so on. No, no, inconsistency indeed, or contradiction. A contradiction itself breeds vitality. Inconsistency itself breeds vitality. But the rationalists would, have, of course, contest this. In 1953, Tange and the architectural journalist and critic Noboru Kawazoe were invited to attend the reconstruction of the Ise Shrine. The shrine has been reconstructed every 20 years. And in 1953, it was the 59th iteration. Normally, the reconstruction process was a very closed affair. But this time, the ceremony was open to architects and journalists to document the event. This, the ceremony coincided with the end of the American occupation, and it seemed to symbolize a new start in Japanese architecture. In 1965, when Tange and Kawazoe published the book Ise, Prototype of Japanese Architecture, which I'm blessed to have, and is a very, very, very special book, he likened the building to a modernist structure, an honest expression of materials, of functional design, and prefabricated elements. Uh, I don't know if you know about this. It's truly uh, the, the beginning of spirituality in, uh, in, in Japan and, and also in, in some respects, if not in all, uh, the beginning of architecture in Japan. What happens is this is a shrine, a Shinto shrine. Uh, there are two identical uh, sites. On one is built, was built, I think, in the 9th century or the 11th century, well, about 1,000 years ago, the structures were built. And every 20 years, on the, the adjacent site, they built identically what it was already on the first site. And then they destroy what, what was there. And, and so every 20 years, they do this. We, we read um, about this. And this is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very special way of, uh, of, of continuing something that is very, very, very precious to, to, to them. Uh, also, it has to be mentioned, <clears throat> this is a shrine is dedicated to a lady, to a woman, to Amaterasu, the, the sun goddess. While in Europe, the sun is uh, male, is masculine, in Japan is feminine, is a woman. The woman is the sun, Amaterasu. Uh, beautiful uh, mythology and a beautiful architecture. Truly, this architecture of this shrine of this complex, in my opinion, is, 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 is perfect. Uh, and yes, uh, Kenzo Tange contributed to this beautiful book uh, which can be found, but unfortunately, is an, an expensive book. I, I was lucky to find it less expensively, and I have it, but it's somewhere in an attic in Sibiu. Now, we look at Tange House, his own house from 1951 to 1953. You know, it's, it's, it's clearly uh, rooted in the tradition of Japan, but it, it, it also has something so-called modern. And I like very much the fact that you know, on the, on the ground floor, there are some partitions, so it's half closed, half, half opened. Um, I like this building very much. It's, it's uh, you know, it's uh, clearly in Japan, it's clearly, um, you know, uh, well, maybe this less clearly. I see a certain modernism in it, but maybe it's not so clear unless, uh, you know, you, um, or maybe I fantasize, maybe because I know it was built by, by Tange in the 1950s. Uh, I, unfortunately, I don't think I have here a, a, a quotation from him where he explained doubts, uh, exp uh, expressed doubts about, um, uh, you know, the validity to, to uh, of the attempt to connect with tradition. Um, he said, yes, you must be rooted in it, but then you have to emancipate yourself from it. I think he was aware of the dangers where you become uh, trapped in nostalgia, 
and uh, you do not you do not assert your time and place your creativity in terms of the time you live in Kenzo Tange his own house he was doing already well as we can see I mean in Japan to have such a plot of land is um, to use uh, Francis Keres words luxury uh, here it is you know I mean <laughs> Who has in Japan such a plot of land? But he deserved it. He was a, he was a remarkable uh, uh, architect and cultural figure. I don't know um, why I place this figure, uh, this, uh, this image here. I see there is a cemetery and uh, I don't know. Maybe he took a picture. Here is his... Uh, uh, built work for the Hiroshima War Memorial. Can we imagine the suffering of the Japanese when the Americans bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki? You know, and how come? I mean, I don't want to 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 remember. You know, that this very moment a country is bombed. You know, at this very moment, Hiroshima Peace Center, 1949-1956. Uh, yes, clearly modernism, a vigorous modernity, but not an arrogant one. I don't think this building is arrogant. And indeed, how could a peace memorial be arrogant, especially in a city that was devastated by uh, the atomic bomb? So this is the Hiroshima Peace Memorial by Kenzo Tange in uh, Hiroshima. The city literally who sprang from ashes. A good work. Uh, we see here, we see what we could also see in Kiev and other cities in we, Ukraine, you know, it, it, I am so revolted, I don't understand, I, I cannot understand how this could happen after we went through the terrors of the Second World War. I mean, Russia lost millions of people in the Second World War. How could it do equal tragedies in the 21st century? I, I don't understand. An art center, 1955, 1957, as I said, I'll go a little bit quickly because um, I'm afraid the laptop might uh, die, but also because there are three presentations I will make. The second and the third one are less long than the one on Kenzo Tange. Now, yes, he used a lot of uh, concrete. That's why some of his works are considered uh, brutalist. But uh, at that time, uh, concrete was not considered the material that polluted. People didn't think of this. So I'm, it's not that I'm trying to excuse Kenzo Tange, but truly really it was a different time than the one we live uh, in today. Uh, Imabari um, City Hall Complex, 1958. Um, yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, uh, um, you know, um, uh, vigorous masculine uh, work, if I can, if I can, uh, if I can call it so. Uh, I was silent a little bit because I should have used this work to show um, the plagiarisms of a certain Swiss architect. Uh, who clearly inspired himself from this work, uh, and not only from his work. Anyway, the Kagawa, Kaka, Kagawa Prefectural Government Office, Japan, 1958. Yes, it's a government building. Yes, it's not extravagant, but I think it's done with um, conviction and sensitivity. This was a heroic architecture. Uh, Japan emerged, you know, destroyed by the Second World War. And, uh, you know, they needed heroism. They needed, uh, you know, sacrifice even. But it's not a, 
you know, it's not an architecture that laments. No, quite the opposite. It's an almost an optimistic architecture, a very vigorous architecture, expresses the will to live of these remarkable people. And they are remarkable. I mean, how to explain that they have so many good architects and not only architects. Yes, they work very hard. The Japanese work very hard. Uh, they are workaholics as the, as the word goes. Kurashiki, Kurashiki City Hall from 1960. So 60 years ago, um, yeah, this is the plan. And uh, you see the, the building soon. The model, and here it is. 1960, Kenzo Tange, City Hall. Yeah, this is not a sweet architecture, you know, it's not a gingerbread architecture. This is a this is an architecture that um, advocated uh, heroic stance in life. And it had to, it had to, you know, uh, this country had to, uh, had to, you know, uh, despair or it had to build, uh, you know, uh, itself again, and they did it. This housing from 1961 is rather interesting. Uh, you don't quite expect this kind of architecture in, in Japan, or I don't. But it, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, vigorous uh, modernity, uh, you know, uh, Syria, well, we could say there is some structuralist here, the rhythmicity of the this front uh, of uh, row houses, but because they are at, a, at an angle, they are not perpendicular, uh, on the street or uh, parallel with the street, this creates a, uh, you know, something uh, dynamic. This cultural center from 1963 is very interesting. I like it. I always like this building, uh, maybe because it has this duality, you know, like almost two triangles facing each other. I am pay. It's possible he inspired himself from this building in a, in a very good building he built in Washington, DC. Anyway, this building by, um, uh, by Kenzo Tange is one of my preferred ones. It's true, it's a fortress. It's a concrete fortress and it's austere, but it's very powerful, I would say. This is not a building that, um, you know, is trying to, you know, uh, be sweet with you. No, it's it's uh, it's a heroic building, and uh, you know the so-called <clears throat> damages of the the elements on the concrete. In my opinion, add something to the building. This patina, the darkening, it makes it even more interesting. Concrete, of course, it's like a bunker. It's uh, it's it's a fortress. But, you know, if we compare this heroic architecture of Japan from that time, the 60s, with the, what they do now, it's a, it's a big transformation. They still have interesting architects, but that heroic stance is kind of gone. Maybe now we have a different kind of heroism, you know, like an anti-heroic heroism. I know it's a paradox. I am referring to Ishigami, to, to Fujimoto, to Kazuyo Sejima with the white, slender, thin uh, architectures. No, they, they wouldn't be like Kenzo Tange was building. Now, this person wrote here, Kenzo Tange's buildings will make you believe in a better future. Well, uh, let's hope. It's because of the, you know, vigorous, uh, uh, you know, outlook and the, the yeah, the, the uh, vitality and then, the, you know, uh, the heroic, um, not just appearance, you can tell that this is a, an architecture which is uh, uh, not uh, disposed to make too many compromises.
You see, even the cracks or imperfections of the material are contributing actually to the vitality of the building. So this is what, what he, I, I, I mentioned a little bit about this, that uh, Kenzo Tange was, um, let, let me read what he wrote. We Japanese architects in our endeavors to resolve the problems facing modern Japan have devoted a great deal of attention to the Japanese tradition and have in the end arrived at the point which I have sought to elucidate for you. If, however, there can be detected a trace of tradition in my works or in those of my generation, then our creative powers have not been at their best. Then we are still in the throes of evolving our creativity. I want by all means my buildings to be free of the label traditional. Uh, understand, you know, because he wanted to push forward his country, you know, and uh, uh, even if they were rooted in tradition, they didn't want to be uh, traditional or traditionalists. Um, so maybe we can learn something from him. Olympic Arena in Tokyo. This is a great, great work. And if we compare what he did in 1960, 1964, with what uh, Ken Gokuma did for the National Stadium in Tokyo, um, uh, you know, last year for the Olympics last year, we see two different Japans. This is a fresh, original work with a very clear conception, but it's not a simplistic conception. It's very sculptural. It's very logical. In a, it's also beautifully illogical or organic or natural. I love these buildings. <clears throat> and, you know, again, it would be great, great, I think, yes, to compare these two buildings with the building by Ken Gokuma. Because here is, 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 is clearly a new beginning. It's a, it's a fresh uh, architecture. It's powerful. It's inspiring. It's organic. It's uh, at the same time structurally, uh, you know, uh, beyond doubt. Great work by Kenzo, Ken, uh, Kenzo Tange. I almost said Ken Gokuma, but no, not Ken Gokuma. <clears throat> so these are from almost 60 years ago. Now, I don't know who is that person there uh, crying. Demolished, ah, uh, sorry, I, I thought I, I didn't look at the picture. Uh, yes, this was uh, Zaha Hadid's work, which in my opinion would have been great. She won the competition for the stadium, but unfortunately the Japanese uh, sabotaged her. So in the end, uh, the government or whoever decided gave the work to, um, Ken Gokuma, who, in my opinion, built a questionable work. It's too bad that uh, Zaha Hadid was, uh, was sabotaged, even if she won the competition. Uh, that's why this uh, person here cries, because this, this, um, this stadium by Zaha, by Zaha would have been good, I think, better than the one uh, by uh, Ken Gokuma. And I would say closer in spirit to what um, uh, Kenzo Tangye did uh, here. So there are two, uh, two buildings here, a smaller one and a larger one. The small Olympic arena, we already saw it. We look at the plans.
Saint Mary's Cathedral, <clears throat> uh, um, a Christian building in Tokyo from 1963, a great cathedral. A great cathedral built by someone who was not Christian. Architectural creation is a special form of comprehending reality. It works upon and transforms reality through the construction of a substantial object of use. The artistic form of this object, on the other hand, has twofold quality of both mirroring and enriching reality. This understanding of reality, which takes place through architectural creation, requires that the anatomy of reality, its substantial and spiritual structure be grasped as a whole. Um, so here is the plan, uh, I mean the, the top view, the section. Yes, an austere building, yes, a heroic building, yes, a building that was uh, meant for spirit. Yes, for spirit and not for that so-called luxury everybody deserves in uh, Francis Keres opinion. You know, you don't need luxury in order to have access to what we call the sacred. Now, in fact, you need the opposite. It is the house of spirit, that's what it is. It is the house of God, thus it is the house of spirit. No, you know, no cladding here, the interior, there are these great uh, concrete surfaces that uh, create, I think, the, the correct ambience for, uh, you know, uh, spiritual activity. The cathedral and the capacity of 600 seats was built between 1963 and 1964. So St. Mary's Cathedral, uh, let's see what, uh, what is written here. One of the things that struck me from the church, I don't know who wrote this, especially when compared with other Catholic cathedrals in Europe, Latin America and Asia itself, I mean the Philippines, was it was it secluded its secluded character that is there is not a square or a public open space preceding the cathedral as it is common in the western tradition on the contrary the church is located next to a highway hidden behind other buildings and one can only have an idea of its size and magnificent proportions when viewed from a nearby pedestrian bridge uh, Okay, during construction. I personally like more the concrete uh, <clears throat> surfaces, imperfect as it is of the, of, the, of the buildings by Kenzo Tange, as opposed to the Polish surfaces of uh, Tadao Ando. This is one of the most aware, inspiring things I've seen in a minute. I'm not uh, overtly religious, but I can see finding God being relatively easy in a place like this. Whoever said this, Kenzo Tange designed gymnasium in Kagawa at the risk of demolition. This building, another great building by him, and this one, yes, was in great danger of being demolished. The Japanese are, can be as foolish as any other people. Uh, but there was protest, uh, and um, it seems the building is still uh, is still standing. Now you see here the houses, and you see this building built by Kenzo Tange. And yes, now this is a much larger building, but it is a heroic building.
So <clears throat> he died <clears throat> 17 years ago in 2005 on this very day, the second, 22nd of March. And we are thinking of him today. And I think wherever he is, he's uh, smiling towards us. Because I don't know if too many people are paying homage to Kenzo Tange today, but we are. I love, I love these imperfections at the top of the building, you know, let's call them imperfections. You know, accidental ornaments, you know, uh, generated by, uh, you know, the passing time, the elements and so on. I think they are very nice and they are not designed, they are not planned. Although the structure was indeed. Yamanashi Press and Broadcasting Center, another heroic building from 1967. That period uh, in the 60s, early 70s, was, I think, the golden age of Japanese architecture. Look at this, another fortress. You know, heroic, but also optimistic. I think this is an optimistic architecture. You know, it's uh, the castle of uh, broadcasting. They built it and it stands with, uh, with the mountains behind. Yamanashi Broadcasting Center, Japan, Kenzo Tange. Fuji Broadcasting Center, I, I chose to show these two buildings one after the other because you'll see the difference, the transformation. Unfortunately, it's not a positive one in my opinion. Here he became more decorative, in my opinion, less convincing than in the previous work. You know, around 20 years or so separate these two buildings. Still Kenzo Tange, but I think a different Kenzo Tange and also a different Japan. In the 1990s, it was not the same Japan that built this building. No, you look at this building and you look at this one and it's, a, in my opinion, an involution. But maybe it's unavoidable. I don't know. I mean, you know, you go up and then you go down. That's how life is, probably. It still has some interesting things, but it's it's less convincing, you know. This sphere here, it's rather decorative and capriciously placed. It doesn't have the force of, of, of the building uh, here. Uh, this was built by a very affluent and very rich architect, uh, Japan, uh, as opposed to the previous one, which was built by, um, you know, uh, people who struggled to survive from the Second World War. Shizuoka Press and Broadcasting Center in Tokyo. This is an, an interesting building. When was it built? It doesn't, I don't, I didn't write when, when but it's, this is uh, somehow, you know, connecting with, with the earlier works by Kenzo Tange. Now you wonder, I mean, Japan is notorious for its earthquakes. Now look at the cantilever part, you know, they, they seem to have no fear at all of, of, of earthquakes.
Tokyo City Hall, 1991, in my opinion, not a great building, although a huge building. But why did I say I don't think it's great? Because it's already, uh, you know, uh, megalopolis. It's already, I don't know, uh, too triumphalist for my taste. I understand it's the city called of Tokyo, but I only try to imagine how he would have built it if this was built in the 60s and not in the 90s. His office is still on, it still functions. The, the Kenzo Tange office, although he died 17 years ago. His house, you see, from if you compare this building with uh, his house uh, from 1950s, um, you know, you see not just the transformation of Kenzo Tange, <clears throat> but also the transformation of Japan. Now, as an urbanist, uh, because he worked as an urban in urbanism as well, Kenzo Tange, uh, he was uh, part of the metabolist movement. And uh, I like the fact that these people, uh, you know, uh, were investigating new ways of being in the world, uh, architecturally speaking. And, um, you know, there, there is something uh, positive in, in, in this activity as an urbanist at large scale, uh, as opposed to just doing uh, objects, so to speak, or, you know, individual buildings. They were dreamers, and he was not the only one. They had a remarkable group of architects, part of the metabolism movement, like Kurokawa or Kikutake, um, you know, they, I envy them, that's all I can say. They were dreamers. But dreamers and doers, not just dreamers, you know, laying uh, comfortably on the sofa and uh, having sweet dreams. No, they were dreaming and doing. You know, thinking about is extending on water, you know. We they, they were willing to transform themselves and their own country. They, 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 uh, they had this vitality of pioneers. But they will not realize these things, but you know, the simple fact that they thought of this, you know, it was a rejuvenate, rejuvenating uh, activity. This gave birth to, to a lot of confidence in the, in the country and in themselves and in architecture. Here he is contemplating, uh, you know, his urban scheme. Why is it that we don't dream like this? Of course, we live in a different time, dwarfed by the pandemic, dwarfed by the war in Ukraine, dwarfed by the climate change, dwarfed about many things. But I think we need visionaries. We need people to dream. We need people to look at, at, at their works, just like Kenzo Tange looks here. You know, not in an arrogant way. He doesn't seem to, have, to be arrogant. He's, he's thinking, he's meditating. Design philosophies. <clears throat> the Tange did not imagine himself as a leading form giver. He sees himself in a state of transition. I don't know who wrote this. Uh, <clears throat> the role of transition is that of a catalyst, which furthers a chemical reaction, but is no longer detectable in the end result. This about this we already read. He also contributed in the met metabolist movement. Many metabolists had studied under Kenzo Tange at Tokyo University Stange Laboratory. Okay, so now we go to the second architect. <clears throat> so uh, Kenzo Tange died on the on the twenty second of March, um, two thousand five, and now we go to a very different kind of architect, less spectacular and more distanced uh, in time uh, from us than than uh, than Kenzo Tange, but I thought we should pay homage to him too. This Frenchman who actually was active in Denmark, and he was born in 1720 on the on the 22nd of March. 
and that's the reason we talk about him today, Nicolas Henri Jardin. Uh, let's uh, see, Nicolas Henri Jardin, a neoclassical architect, <coughs> was born in Saint Germain de Noyer, department Saint and Marne in France, <coughs> and worked 17 years in Denmark. <coughs> as an, I'm sorry, my 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 voice uh, it seems he wants wants to leave me. As an architect to the royal court, he introduced neoclassicism to Denmark. Here he was. He seems like a nice man in this painting. Uh, so he was French, but for 17 years he worked in Denmark. <clears throat> he also uh, drew a lot, uh, designed a lot, uh, but we'll see some buildings by him. The Yellow Mansion in Copenhagen, 1764, 1766, 67, um, and kind of yellowish indeed. Uh, let's see. Well, what can we say? It's a mansion, yes. An urban one, not in, in nature. Uh, neoclassical, let's, let's not be too surprised because we already know he was a neoclassical architect as opposed to Kenzo Tange, who was not a neoclassical architect, far from it. Anyway, <laughs> this is Copenhagen, this is Denmark, and this is Monsieur Jardin, a Frenchman who worked in, in Copenhagen. Interior work at Christian Borg Palace, also mid 18th century, especially decoration of the Great Hall, which burned down in the fire of 1794. So I don't know if there are pictures now. Redesign of the Fredensborg Palace, garden and park. Um, Nicolas-Henri Jardin. He was an architect, but his family name, as you know, means garden, Jardin in France, in French. Interesting thing, no, to be an architect, but your name to be garden. Imagine a gardener whose name, family name was building. John Building, for example, or I don't know. Anyway, a different time, of course, the 18th century, Copenhagen, and, uh, you know, uh, not just in within the city. A nice palace, actually. And I like this uh, marriage between, uh, you know, a generous geometrical, symmetrical scheme and some rurality because the buildings are, you know, just uh, some of them are one floor, the others two floors high. That's it. Very well kept otherwise. And the octagon, of course, the courtyard, the magical octagon. The one beloved by Leonardo da Vinci and not by just by him, of course. Redesign of summer residence at Bernstorf, Bernstorf Palace. Again, mid 18th century for the foreign minister, uh, Johan, whatever the name. Um, now, of course, Kenzo Tangi, if he lived in, in Denmark in the 18th century, he would not have built like he built in Japan in the 20th century. That's why, as Maria Olbrich said, and it's written on the facade of the secessionist building in Vienna, to each time it's art and to art it's freedom. You cannot be like this, you know, in the 21st century or in the 20th century, but in the mid 18th century, of course, it was very possible. Uh, redesign of a castle, again, uh, Nicolas Henri Jardin, the man who brought neoclassicism to, to Denmark.
As I said, this presentation and the next one I, are rather short compared to the one by uh, on uh, on Kenzo Tange. And I'm happy it's not too long because I'm beginning to be a little bit tired. Um, anyway, it's good, I think, that we attempt to, to say happy birthday to Nicolas Henri Jardin. I am far from being an expert in, um, you know, neoclassical Danish architecture. But there is something Danish about these buildings. Of course, I know that they are built in Denmark. But I, even if I didn't know, I think I would have said that it must be somewhere in, uh, in a Scandinavian country and probably Denmark. OK, and now we go to the third presentation about the cousin of Le Corbusier. Uh, an interesting uh, architect, actually, uh, much less known than uh, Charles Edouard uh, D. Le Corbusier, but I think it's important to, to, to know of him because uh, you'll see he built some interesting things and uh, uh, in, in some respects, in a certain case, I think he was more noble than Le Corbusier and I'll, we, I'll, I will explain what I want to say a little bit later. So Pierre Genre, 1896 and died in 1967. Uh, he was actually nine years younger than, uh, than uh, his uh, star uh, cousin, Le Corbusier. So Pierre Genre, born in 1896, uh, was a Swiss architect, you see the 22nd of March, and today is the 22nd of March, was a Swiss architect who collaborated with his cousin, Charles Edouard Genre, who assumed the pseudonym Le Corbusier for about 20 years. Uh, that's a remarkably long uh, time, you know, because I imagine Le Corbusier was not uh, uh, an easy uh, partner of work at all. In 1922, the Genre cousins set up an architectural practice together. So at that time, Pierre Genre was 26 years old, uh, while Le Corbusier was 35. <clears throat> From 1927 to 1937, they worked together with Charlotte Perriot, a remarkable uh, lady uh, architect, and the Le Corbusier, uh, the Le Corbusier Pierre Genre studio, Rue de Sèvres. So, uh, initially, the, the architecture office belonged to both Le Corbusier and Pierre Genre, uh, the man we pay homage to today. In 1929, the trio prepared the house fitting section for the decorative artist exhibition and asked for a group stand, renewing and widening the 1928 avant-garde group idea. Nice. We need that too, again. This was refused by the decorative artists uh, committee. They resigned and founded the Union of Modern Artists, Union des Artistes Modernes, UAM. The cousins later designed many buildings, including a number of villas and vacation houses and renovated existing buildings as well. Their working relationship ended when Pierre joined the French resistance and the Corbusier worked with the Vichy government, a collaborationist regime to the Nazi Germany. Let's read this again. The working relationship of Charles Edouard Genre and Pierre Genre ended when Pierre joined the French revolution, uh, the French resistance, sorry, and Le Corbusier worked with the Vichy, Vichy government, which collaborated with the Nazi Germany. This is something we should not forget. In my opinion, Pierre was, was on the right side of history, but not Le Corbusier. And I have the highest admiration uh, and affection for Le Corbusier, but it hurts to see that politically, Pierre was also younger, uh, was uh, much more um, correct than uh, Le Corbusier. They collaborated once again after the war on the plan and architecture for the new town of Chandigarh in India. Uh, 
And uh, actually, Le Corbusier left Chandigarh, uh, returned to France, while Pierre remained in India. And there he built, and uh, he also uh, supervised the construction of the buildings in the Chandigarh capital, and also designed furniture. It has some remarkable uh, uh, pieces of furniture, chairs uh, mainly. So this was um, this was uh, Pierre Genre, again Pierre Genre. Hello, Monsieur Genre. Uh, happy birthday to you. I'm absolutely sure he was a, a very capable uh, and interesting man. Can you imagine Le Corbusier with, uh, collaborating, uh, you know, in positions of, uh, you know, equality with someone who didn't have himself uh, significant, uh, you know, uh, qualities, intellectual, uh, artistic, and so on. Pierre Genre, the younger cousin of Le Corbusier, here he is again. You are going to see a picture. Um, let's. I hope I have it here with both of them. Here he is on the bike in India in Chandigarh. Um, you know, uh, near one of the buildings they build there. Here he is with Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier on the left, and uh, he's young, a little bit younger. Well, not so little. Nine years younger. Um, cousin Pierre Jean standing. Yeah, this is the picture which amused me always when I looked at Le Corbusier. In my opinion, a little bit, uh, you know, questionably dressed, uh, you know, in, in that, this, uh, you know, ceremonial way, uh, considering what he was doing there. But who knows, maybe they were going to an important meeting or returning from an important meeting. Anyway, I think Le Corbusier had a genuine affection for Pierre. And it was probably reciprocal. Drawings of Pierre Genre uh, for chairs, he designed chairs, he built chairs, you'll see them. He was a good designer, he was a good architect, you know. Uh, and unfortunately, I mean, he had uh, the lack of luck to, 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 to live and work in the shadow of uh, Le Corbusier. But uh, that's why I think it's important sometimes to look at who is in the shadow of anything, because sometimes there is value uh, in, in places where we don't think of searching for. And, um, you know, uh, there are such cases, you know, the good architects who are not known, they are not famous. I mean, he is in, in a way, you know, Pierre Genre is still a genre, but um, not everybody knows about him. Anyway, we do the symposium in memory, memory of Pierre Genre. Uh, I, I, this was a building. I don't know what happened with this building. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if it was built. And I don't know why I made this presentation uh, two or three years ago. Uh, I forgot why it is called. Maybe this, this wording is connected with what we look at here. Uh, maybe some kind of a ceremonial building. Uh, you know, I don't know why it is called a symposium, but anyway, it's a drawing. We are going to look at buildings he built, architecture, architecture, Gandhi, Bahavan, Bah 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 um, not bad, you know. I, I mean, uh, if this was built by Le Corbusier, I would have said the same thing. It's not bad. Was built by Pierre Genre. I, I almost like it a little more than some of the buildings built by his more uh, more famous uh, brother uh, cousin. Now maybe there is some influence here coming from Le Corbusier, and maybe it's not uh, it's not a uh, little influence. I don't know, but uh, it's 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 a good building and um, built not by Le Corbusier but by Pierre Jarret. So I guess it's some kind of a memorial for Gandhi. Not bad, Pierre Genre. It's 
it's always good to have some water around the building, you know, because you have the reflection. <clears throat> and even if the building is not impressive, when it is reflect, uh, reflected and thus uh, multiplied with two, you have a building twice, so to speak, it becomes interesting. But in this case, the building has value, architecturally speaking, and uh, you know, with or without the reflection in, in the water. Now, Pierre Jeanre, the house museum in Chandigarh is his own house in Chandigarh, which is now a museum. This one also is interesting, you know, it's more subdued than the buildings by uh, Le Corbusier, but uh, it, it has qualities. And I, I like in a way the fact that it's not, uh, you know, uh, extravagant, uh, you know, it's more subdued, but uh, it does have qualities. Also, I like the fact that he employs uh, ornamentation, you know, like uh, what we see here in red and also, you know, the texture of this wall. So it's not uh, the dogmatic whiteness of Villa Savoie. This is almost like an abstraction of a portrait, you know, of a face with an eye and, uh, you know, I wonder if he did it intentionally, but it's interesting because it is a little bit curved, this wall and the, the way the shadow um, at this particular um, point in the day when the sun, the sunlight comes the, the way it does here. Interesting work, his own house, Pierre Jeanre. He built those chairs uh, here he is, very interesting chair, and he built it. I saw a picture, I don't, I don't know if I have it here in this presentation, with uh, many discarded chairs by Pierre Jeanre. I think part of one of the major structures at Chandigarh, they were cleaning up or something, where I hope I have that picture, because, you know, beautiful chairs you know, very solidly made, maybe not so adventurous as this one, which has a hybridity about it because of the different materials he used. But uh, I think uh, he, I think he was good, uh, Pierre Genre. And I'm absolutely sure uh, Le Corbusier knew it too. That's why he was partners with uh, Pierre Genre for 20 years. Interesting that I look at this window and at this door, the way the glass is divided into smaller parts. And I don't know if you know, there is a picture with Le Corbusier in his so-called office near Le Cabanon in the south of France, where he returned to the grandma window, so to speak, you know, uh, with, a, with a, you know, the, the glass being divided just like here on this door forget about the horizontal band of glass, um, continuous horizontal window now. Uh, Le Corbusier <laughs> returned to the opposite kind of window. There are pictures with, uh, with him in the, the so-called office, which was actually two meters by three meters, if you can imagine. That was his office, you know, approximately six, six square meters. Yes, true, he was facing the Mediterranean Sea, but... Uh, the space was probably the smallest uh, architecture office uh, in the world ever. Uh, and again, the window was kind of like this. Maybe the influence was not just from Le Corbusier towards uh, Pierre Jeanret, but also from Pierre Jeanret towards Le Corbusier. It's possible. But even here, you know, this, this um, the stair and the handrail in a way, it's more creative than uh, what we see also with a, spire, a spiral staircase at uh, Villa Savoie. Yes, he was not as radical as his more famous brother, uh, cousin, but 
still a good architect. Now, I know there are some people who protest uh, about this kind of uh, arrangement where you have the bathroom with a toilet here, you know, I mean, not only it's an exterior wall, but uh, the, the whole bathroom is, you know, emphatically uh, outside of the limits of the house, so to speak. It's okay. I, I know countless examples like this, but I know that certain people think that this is not appropriate to do, but uh, uh, it's fine. I mentioned Kikutake, the metabolist. Well, he has a, a building which he built actually with a, a hotel with all the bathrooms like um, cells coming out of the body of the, of the hotel, a circular um, hotel. Anyway, this is the house by uh, <clears throat> Pierre Janre, for the Pierre Janre in India, in Chandigarh. Romantic interior. This is a chair designed by him. The other genre, that's how he, he is known as the other genre. But look at these buildings. The other genre, in my opinion, deserves attention. Not Le Corbusier, but Pierre Genre. Not Charles Edouard Genre, T. Le Corbusier, but Pierre Genre. He never changed his name. Type 13 J House in Chandigarh by Pierre Genre. Now, if he would have built such buildings in the present, he probably would have received the Pritzker Prize. After all, uh, you know, uh, such uh, buildings built by Aravena. In fact, uh, I, I wouldn't say they are superior to what uh, Pierre Genre did. Houses for peons, I don't know what peons is, under construction, also sector 23. I think these were buildings in various parts of Shandikar, probably some kind of, uh, you know, social housing. Look, they, they build them uh, with very primitive means. But uh, I like very much this picture. It's alive, you know, it's, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, requirements for uh, in the building industry would not uh, permit for with such ladders uh, or uh, but you know I'm sure that nobody died and they built some interesting things as we can see I like these works very much because again it's not a dogmatic uh, modernism you know you have uh, Yes, it's vigorous. Yes, it's probably not an expensive building or serious of buildings, but they, you know, he introduced ornamentation, you know, yes, uh, on a grid or whatever, but it's still bringing, uh, you know, sensitivity to the building. Another type 5J house, uh, here it is. It would be interesting actually to make a presentation or to, to, to yeah, to present or to study the works, you know, kind of for similar uh, programs or functions, uh, comparative uh, analysis or a comparative, uh, you know, presentation on Le Corbusier and Pierre Genre, because you can tell this is not a building that uh, Le Corbusier would have built, but it was built by his cousin, Pierre Genre. Opera with a question mark, uh, wasn't very clear, in some uh, on some websites, I, 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 yeah, it was an opera. Maybe I placed the, the question mark because I was wondering, did Shandigar really need an opera? Plus, 
this is not how we imagine an opera building is. We imagine an opera be building to be like, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Charles Garnier did in Paris or, uh, you know, med architects in the present, uh, flamboyant uh, building, you know, uh, loudly saying I'm the opera. But look at this, this is very modest. And uh, kind of, I like it in a way more, you know, why should uh, an opera building be, uh, you know, crushingly, uh, you know, uh, distant in a way and, uh, uh, you know, luxurious and all the rest. A more modest uh, opera would be, I think, nice, more humane. Cantina, cantina, and very interesting work you'll see in Shandigar. Look at this, you know, it's a place to eat or cantina in Romanian, but uh, you know, it's done architecturally in an interesting way. Uh, why should be, why, why should a cantina, cantina or cantina be a banal building? And I end this presentation on him with some furniture designs by him. We already know that he designed uh, here. This is the picture that I was referring to with lots of his chairs. I don't know, I hope temporarily they were discarded or uh, you know, taken out from one place in order to be brought to another place. Um, I wish I had such a chair, if not several. Very, you know, uh, massively built, you know, uh, solid wood unlike the furniture of Ikea. This uh, probably would last forever. Pierre Jeanre, the cousin of Le Corbusier, the cousin of Charles Edouard Jeanre, was born on the 22nd of March, 1896, nine years after Le Corbusier was born. At least this furniture, you know, these pieces of furniture were designed by Pierre Jean Ray and not by Charlotte Perion, as it happened with uh, some important pieces of furniture designed by so-called Le Corbusier. That's it. Happy birthday, Pierre Jean Ray.